Hello and welcome to First Look ETF. I'm Stephanie Stanton with ETF Guide. Thank you so much for being with us. Coming up on today's show, we will examine new ETFs that use machine learning to select stocks. Plus, we'll take a closer look at one ETF that invests in new approaches to tackling mental health. And we'll also tell you about another that aims to capture the rebound in hotels and travel. But first, let's get a quick recap of the newest ETF launches on the New York Stock Exchange. Joining us now is Doug Jonas with the NYSC. Hi, Doug. It's great to have you with us. Uh, it's great to be with you, Stephanie. And listen, it has been a record year for us at the New York Stock Exchange. 42 ETFs launched in June alone. But if we're looking at the whole year, that's 210 ETFs now launched. And it has been not just about launches, it's also been about assets coming up on $480 billion in year-to-date cash flow. So it's been a terrific year for ETFs. Yeah, it sounds like exciting stuff. Now, tell us a little bit more about some of the latest trends and some of the new products. Yeah, there's a couple of key themes that really play out in my head. The first is about new managers coming to the market. If I look across all the 48 issuers that launched ETFs this year, half of those brand new to ETFs. So still a very open and welcoming community with a lot of opportunity. The other story has been active management. About 68% of all launches this year are actively managed ETFs. Some of those in the semi-transparent wrapper. So for active managers that are thinking about coming to the market, either, you know, it's never been better and it's a really opportune time to enter. All right, Doug Jonas with the NYSE. Thank you so much for that update. Value stocks have been strong performers since the start of the year, but one firm is aiming to shake up the traditional model of value stocks. We are pleased now to be joined by Kai Wu. He is the founder of Sparkline Capital. Hi, Kai. Thank you so much for being with us. Hello, Stephanie. Thanks a lot for having me. All right, so your firm just launched the Sparkline Intangible Value ETF. The ticker symbol is ITAN. The fund's approach to value investing is very different than traditional models for selecting value stocks. Tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah, we just launched ITAN. We're super excited. Um, it's been a bit of a journey for us. I've been a value investor now for many years, ever since my very first job out of college. But the thing is that over the past several years, since I basically stepped my first foot in the door, um, value has been extremely out of favor. For example, even just over the past decade, the Russell 1000 value index has underperformed growth by about 40%. And people are rightly asking, is value investing dead? Now, I thought a lot about this question. And, you know, ultimately, my conclusion is that the philosophy of value is timeless. The idea of buying stocks below intrinsic value just makes, just makes sense. The problem is that the metrics that investors are using to quantify intrinsic value need to be updated. And that's what ITAN seeks to do. So give us a little bit of insight into the specific metrics and how they're evaluated. Well, let's step back and start with the very beginning. So Ben Graham is considered the father of value investing. He was active in the 1930s in an economy that was largely tangible, where the dominant firms were railroads and steel mills. Traditional value metrics like price to book ratio were effective in such a world. The thing is that over the past century, the economy has transitioned from industrial to information based. As the now reigning king of value, Warren Buffett, likes to say, uh, we live in an asset light economy. And what he means is that unlike the old economy companies like GM, Exxon, and AT&T, today's dominant firms no longer require any net tangible assets to generate earnings. The drivers of value today are intangible. Um, at Sparkline, we like to talk about four intangible pillars. First is intellectual property, then human capital. Third is brand equity, and finally, network effects. The goal of ITAN is to take traditional value concepts and expand the definition of intrinsic value to include not just traditional tangible value, but also intangibles as defined by these four pillars. Given that, you know, I would imagine that it would be challenging to sort of quantify intangible assets. Can you give us a little bit more insight into exactly how you guys do that? You're absolutely right. Now, the main challenge with quantifying intangibles is that standardized accounting statements do not really disclose or deal with intangibles. Um, so, for example, if a company invests in R&D, right, instead of that, investment being considered an asset on its balance sheet, it's considered an expense to be subtracted from revenue in computing that income. 
And that is just one of a few, very select few examples of intangible investment that's even disclosed at all on accounting statements. Right? Accounting statements are generally silent on the vast majority of metrics that would potentially be useful. Now, fortunately, we live in a digital age where data is exploding. And there now exist many very interesting non-accounting based data sets that can help us quantify intangible value, such as you know, patent abstracts or labor market data. The problem with this data is that it is, for the most part, unstructured text. And unstructured data tends to have three problems. First, it's very big. Second, noisy. And third, it is not amenable to traditional statistical methods. Like you can't just take this data, dump it to an Excel spreadsheet and hope anything useful comes out of it. And so as a result, you know, we at Sparkline have had to invest in developing natural language processing tools, which are specifically designed to take this data and process it in a way that it can be formed into the four metrics of intangible value for use in our models. Now, you guys have what, like roughly 150 stocks in the portfolio. Tell us a little bit more about your exposure. Yeah, so it, it is a diversified basket. I think one useful lens is to think about the industry composition. Now, the ITN portfolio actually has a very different sector exposure than a traditional value fund. Traditional value funds tend to invest heavily in old economy companies like banks, insurance, and industrials. And this is because by omitting the value of intangibles, they have a really hard time buying companies such as Apple or Google that consist mainly of intangibles. Right? On, on their metrics, they seem kind of expensive all the time. So ITAN, in contrast, by giving companies like Apple and Google credit for this intangible value, is able to hold a much more modern portfolio. Um, for example, the majority of ITAN's industry exposure is actually in things, modern companies like software, hardware, media, and healthcare. So it sounds like it's more of a growth fund then? So that's actually the really cool thing, which is that while the sector composition of ITAN does look much more like that of a growth fund, the actual stock selection algorithms are all bottoms up and valuation driven. So while it is true that fast growing companies, modern companies tend to have more intangibles and that's why they grow fast in the first place. Um, what ITAN does, it doesn't just care about how much intangibles a company has, it cares more about how much it's paying to obtain that fixed amount of intangibles. So as an example, if the FANG stocks, which are intangible rich, were to tomorrow go up 10X without any corresponding increase in their fundamental value, ITAN would sell. And that's in stark contrast to a traditional growth fund, which they will just buy high flying companies with, you know, uh, hot, fast historic growth without any regards to valuation, which as we saw in the dot com bubble is kind of a risky bet. So then with that being said, how do you see this ETF being used inside a diversified portfolio? First of all, the goal of ITAN is to achieve long term capital appreciation by buying the stocks of US large and mid cap companies. So to the extent you, as an investor, have an allocation to a U.S. value manager, um, you could con consider replacing some or all of that allocation with ITAN. And what we would say is that that might help you modernize your portfolio without requiring you to sacrifice the value paradigm. On the other hand, if you were more of an absolute return investor, uh, you could consider ITAN as part of a U.S. core allocation. As you mentioned, ITN holds about 150 different securities and as a result is quite diversified. Um, but unlike index funds that mechanically track indices such as the S&P 500, ITN is actively managed. And we believe that allows it to adapt to the economy as it evolves over time and um, to opportunistically take advantage of dislocations in valuations as they crop up. And look, Said differently, the goal of ITAN is to provide investors with exposure to a portfolio of modern, high quality companies with a margin of safety. All right. Well, Kai Wu, Sparkline Capital, thank you so much for being with us here on First Look ETF. Thank you.
Even before COVID-19, the prevalence of mental illness among adults and young people has been increasing. This is according to Mental Health America. Well, here to talk about a new ETF that owns companies tackling this problem is Sylvia Jablonski. She is the Chief Investment Officer at Defiance ETFs. Hi, Sylvia. Thank you so much for being with us. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Glad to be here. You know, as we know, mental illness, unfortunately, is on the rise, but there are many types of new pioneering treatments in this field. And you guys have created an ETF that aims to capitalize on some of those treatments. Can you tell us about it? Sure. So Defiance has launched an ETF called um, the Psychedelics ETF. The ticker symbol is PSY. And, you know, you sort of started to go into it, but we were just looking at the general space for mental health. And, you know, if you look at mental health illness, one in 10 people suffer from some sort of mental illness. And around the world, there's about 300 million people that suffer specifically from depression. Um, Further to that, there's about $2.5 trillion that gets spent on trying to cure depression. And about 30% of the people who are, you know, afflicted with this disease actually never get cured. And what's even more interesting is that the big pharmaceutical companies have actually cut their budgets by 70% in this particular space. So, you know, you have this perfect sort of storm of millions of people being impacted by an illness with, with, you know, essentially uh, 30% of the population having no form of treatment. So we started hearing about alternative medicine and different types of treatments that were seeing positive results in, in different trials and medical studies, things like that. So psychedelics are, you know, sort of the, the, the street word for it is uh, magic mushrooms, things like um, MDNA, LSD, They've, you know, they've in the past been criminalized drugs, but now have been studied by prestigious universities like Johns Hopkins, for example, Columbia University, NYU, um, as potential therapy treatment uh, options. So there's a group called MAPS, for example, that had two phases of, of trials where they had, you know, severe mental illness sufferers, PTSD, depression, having guided therapy and taking uh, MDNA for periods of time. And the study found that two thirds of those people that had never had success with typical generic drugs were actually cured. So we were really curious about this. Um, we started hearing things like, you know, in, in Colorado and in Oregon, these uh, therapeutic centers have been approved and popped up and people are using it there. Um, at Johns Hopkins, they they were you know running sort of like massive research projects around psychedelics, and the data is really amazing. So you know what we're sort of hearing and seeing now is that you know although this is a down the road, this is going to take some time in terms of approval. The FDA is looking at it. You know we're talking about getting into phase three trials. We're talking about centers starting to open up, and if all of these things happen, you know. Essentially, you're looking at a market that is estimated to be worth a hundred billion dollars. You know, right now we're, we're in, you know, the single digit of, of, of billions in terms of this because it's not considered an approved sort of, um, treatment plan. But we just looked at that and we thought, you know, this is going to be the future of medicine. Alternative medicine is going to be something that, you know, plays a very legitimate role in our society, especially if, you know, the big pharmaceutical companies are sort of done with, with investing in, you know, the current generic drugs and whatnot. So we're starting to have rumblings of like Johnson & Johnson getting into this and, and whatnot, the bigger names. But our ETF actually gives you access to the companies that have exposure to both, you know, cannabis and psychedelic type of uh, types of companies. I think everyone knows the cannabis story, right? Uh, alternative cancer treatment, things like that. Um, but the focus is really on psychedelics. So it's companies like Compass, which, which launched and, um, you know, after it IPO was up about a hundred percent, MindMed over the last, you know, year and a half up 600%, you know, the Peter Thiel investment, um, at Thai Technologies is, is, is also out since June and, you know, up double digits close to 20%. So, you know, it seems like there are a lot of these pharmaceutical companies that are getting into the space. It may have a positive path towards, you know, being approved by the FDA and is a treatment option. So we just think that, you know, just in general, biotech, aging population, growth of mental illness, it's, it's a way for investors to get exposure to that space. Yeah. And this is so fascinating to me. You know, it's funny. I was just reading um, there's an HG, 
TV star that was just crediting something called Toad. Uh, there's ayahuasca that we've heard of. So this is very interesting and it is emerging. Um, it sounds like you guys are really um, getting ahead of the game. Yeah, I mean, we really believe in this space and we try to think about, you know, the, the future of like the way that Defiance looks at things is we try to think about, you know, what is sort of the next generation of things? What is the next generation of technology? What is the next generation of medicine? And this was just a no brainer for us. You know, this, the studies, the, the results of the studies, I mean, two thirds of people actually being called cured, forget just, you know, treated and kind of like getting by. I mean, they're labeling them cured um, it is it's fascinating to us. Absolutely. Well, uh, definitely an interesting ETF there. Let's shift gears a little bit because you guys are uh, doing a bit of a 180 here. You're also tackling the travel industry. Uh, you are creating an ETF that aims to capitalize on the resurgence, if you will, of air travel, hotels, things like that. Tell us about it. Yeah, so it's really interesting because about a year and a half ago, everything was about working from home, right? Working from home, studying from home. We were never going to get on a plane again. We were never going to go on vacation again. It, you know, it sort of felt like dire straits, but here we are. We have so much pent up energy and demand to get out of the house and experience entertainment and travel and, you know, go places and do things. We're able to do that because, you know, the vaccines have so far proven to be effective. A lot of people have been taking them. So in places where, um, in the U.S., for example, where high percentages of people are vaccinated, you know, travel feels like it's a little bit safer. So we thought it's it's going to be really hard to pick the winners about in terms of like the reopen trade, right? Do you go with hotels first? Do you go with airlines first? Do you go with, you know, casinos? Do you go with cruise ships? What what could it be? So in our minds, we thought, you know, like like United Airlines is go, is probably going to do really well, but they have more debt than say Delta. So will Delta, you know, sort of flourish first? And what about Ryanair when international borders are partially closed? So the reason we launched this is we just thought this is one place where an investor can can buy an ETF that gives you exposure to hotels, airlines, and cruises, and it's the pure reopen trade. So Memorial Day weekend, you know, 20, 20 some odd million people got out and traveled. Another 10 million on top of that hit the road and, and you know, sort of the, the friendly skies on 4th of July weekend. TSA is reporting about 2 million people a day, you know, we're, and we're still, and if you think about an investment opportunity, you look back to March, right? It looked like we hit all time highs and that was sort of the, the sector rotation trade there. But, you know, here we are, we're actually still 20% off of pre-pandemic travel levels. The U.S. borders are closed if you're not a U.S. citizen, like you can't come here from Europe, for example, um, you know, uh, barring visa or, or special issues or whatnot. Um, and, and you know, the names are about 15% off of their post-COVID highs. So it's still a great opportunity. We put everything in one place and gave investors access to some of those different sectors. All right. Well, it sounds great. Sylvia Jablonski, uh, Defiance ETFs, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Well, that does it for today's episode of First Look ETF. I want to thank all of our guests, including Doug Jonas from the New York Stock Exchange. Thank you so much. For